Well, welcome everyone. Uh, here we're talking about best practices for migrating from on-prem into Azure, but uh, these practices will pretty much apply to anything that you want to do, which is what you'll find is interesting about the whole thing. Uh, I am Michael Wall, and I work for a company called 3Cloud, which is based in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I'm a senior consultant, and I do a lot of database type stuff. Uh, I seems like right now I think I have five different customers and lots of migration opportunities from on-prem to uh, the cloud. But there's been a couple that haven't been to the cloud too. So that's one of the things to keep in mind here. Also, uh, I'm a member of the Oregon data community. Uh, I'm one of the co-presidents and we uh, keep really busy. And I want to talk about even though PASS is no longer an organization, even though a lot of people here have been members of PASS. The main thing is, is that I'm going to talk about this a little bit more is that you need to get out there, uh, be a speaker. It's a lot of fun and it's really helped my career, which is why I have this picture of the cat. There'll be more cat pictures here too. Um, I guarantee you, I give this every time I talk, I always mention this is that uh, you should go out and join up with some local groups. Because if you look around, it's like tips on being a good DBA, being a good data professional. Go out there and do the networking. Find the local groups. You know, like Frank here is in, uh, in charge of his group. And let him know that you want to talk about something. And I guarantee you that the group leaders would be happy to have someone uh, be willing to present on any topic, 15, 20, 30, or even 60 minutes. And once you start doing it, you start to enjoy it. And you'll see there's a, it's good for you. I purposely pick topics on things that I don't know anything about. So it forces me to learn and you get that confidence too. So you just, there's nothing really wrong about doing presentations. But you're not here to talk about, hear about me, but we're going to talk about lifting and shifting. So a lot of this came from some painful experiences at uh, a company I used to work for. We're not going to talk about them, but anyway, uh, there were Things weren't quite prepared, and so I realized that there were some really good opportunities here to learn on how to do things better. Uh, so lifting and shifting is considered an industry standard term. The idea is that you are moving a server, whether it be on, uh, heavens forbid, an old physical server or if it's on a VM. But the point is, is that you are moving it from a so-called terrestrial data center to actually another terrestrial data center, because as we all really know, that Azure, the cloud is actually a bunch of terrestrial data centers. Uh, but the point is that you can access it from anywhere. And uh, since we were talking about Azure, again, our friends at Microsoft are taking away the cost of maintaining that physical center from you. <clears throat> One of the things about Azure, though, is that it's not all uh, rainbows and sunshine, as I like to say. Uh, there are some real limitations. Uh, and the main one is your network, because think about it. You have to connect to your data. So you have to think about these things. But there's a lot of things you can do to prepare for moving to the cloud. Now, this primarily this topic, this presentation is going to be about moving to VM. So we're going to be talking about the IaaS portion of Azure. We're not going to be talking about platform as a service except for a little bit, uh, but we can also go on to that if you'd like to. There's some common terms here, and some of the uh, older people in the audience may recognize some of these things. Uh, it's the funny thing is that a lot of these things never change. So compute has now become the common terminology for the CPU portion of the Azure VM, or if you're in AWS or any of the other cloud services, but the idea is that that talks about the VM. So IOPS, we're gonna talk about IOPS a lot, inputs and outputs per second. Latency, the time it takes for a transaction to complete. So let, let's say if you were a gamer and you were to click on a command, and if it takes more than a few milliseconds, you're gonna complain about the latency, your ping. QDEPs, number of commands that are stacked up. Again, and a very important topic to think about here. Network security group, we're gonna talk a little bit about networking because it's important for one of those things that you need to have that conversation with your business when you're doing the migration of your applications of your databases to Azure. And then finally, DTUs. Uh, not as common anymore in Azure, uh, They've since they've in, uh, instituted the whole serverless concept, but uh, just a couple of years ago, it was all about the DTUs. Lifting and shifting. Here's one of the many cat pictures. So we look here at the catio. So lifting and shifting sounds great, 
Uh, but in reality, it's not quite like the catio on the left. It's more like the uh, Japanese cat on the right squeezed into the box. Again, we're going to talk about a couple different types of lift and shift. So the main ones we're going to be going about, so on-prem SQL Server to either onto an Azure VM, to Azure SQL Database, Azure SQL Managed Instance, and also Azure Data Warehouse. We are mostly going to be talking about moving to an Azure VM, but we will touch on the other three topics briefly. So compute. When you go to the Azure Marketplace, you have a choice of the different servers that you can buy. And one of the main values that you need to worry about is the compute value. So the compute is actually a a uh, combination of the CPUs and RAM, even though that they're still uh, listed. But I mean, when you talk about compute, you're actually talking about the computer. And so that's where the CPU and the RAM val values come in. But as we're going to talk about in a, to death is about the IOPS and the throughput level, because that's where they really get you. This right here is a chart from the Azure Marketplace. It's um, so-called D-class. Now, I have to admit that this is slightly dated just because I've actually been using the E-class lately for when I do SQL Server configurations, but the D-class are a good standard workhorse for running SQL Server. So let's look at this briefly right here. So again, you have the names of the class, and then here's your CPUs and your memory. One of the really important things that you need to consider, especially with SQL Server, is that you want to make sure that you have this temp storage because it makes all the difference in the world. Data is not usually a problem. I mean, you you need to be aware of this, but uh, the fact is, is that you can buy big enough disks that you don't really need to worry about the number of disks that you have attached, but it could be an issue. And then the confusing part right here, we're going to talk about this. So this is where Microsoft gets you. And it's not that they're doing it deliberately, but one of the points I'm going to make along the way is that Microsoft is going to give you exactly what you pay for, nothing more, but nothing less. So it's all about being dialed in the service. So when I talk about, when I showed you the picture of the Catio, the Catio is really more of what you would think of kind of like the on-prem experience where you have a data, a data center and you have some servers and you have some disk and you have your network and you have a lot of control and it's really easy. Um, you get a lot more wiggle room for lack of a better term because your data center is gonna give you as many resources as you really need because you've paid for it, while as compared on Azure, the uh, here am I showing my lack of mouse control? The Azure right here is this is what you're getting for. So you're going to pay for the box, and if you're too big for that box, you need to pay more money. That's all there is to it. So throttle points. The server has a max IOPS or IOPS input output or throughput and or. So we look right here, uh, we can see the uh, the throughput and then we also have the IOPS. So right here is, so here's the IOPS. So for, so for this D class server right here, right here, you can see that the actual server level that you have 8,000 IOPS. And that's by the second. Um, and then also there's the throughput. So it's like how much data that you're moving through. So again, IOPS are the actual transactions, and then throughput is how much you're, how much data you're moving through. Now it gets a little bit confusing here. We're going to talk about this briefly. Is that this first column right here is if you're doing caching on your disks, and then this one is if you're not doing caching. And as this presentation has evolved over the past two years, uh, you know, originally. I recommend caching. I'm still going to recommend caching for SQL Server, but it's also behooves you to take a look at the uncached throughput as well and think about that when you're planning for a server. So the so I talk about IOPS for a little bit. So when you're looking at Perfmon, Perfmon still works in the cloud. It unfortunately doesn't work for Azure SQL Database, or if it does, someone please tell me how to do that. But it still certainly works on your VM in the cloud. So you can, set up, uh, you can set up your perfmon, but the main thing is that you're looking at the disk transfers per second. So the read bytes and the write bytes, uh, you wanna see the completed transactions. Throughput. Um, so again, that's gonna be your read bytes per second, the write bytes per second. So that's how much data is being delivered. Um, 
it's more of a concern for a data warehouse, but it can be a national problem with a more of a OLTP uh, TP type of transaction situation. Latency, how long does it take? So I mentioned a gaming experience, but also like in a business experience. So a user goes into your uh, POS or something like that, and they want to enter in a transaction for somebody in AR. So they click the mouse, they wait for the transaction to save, and they're waiting, and they're waiting, and waiting. So latency is really important because that is how uh, is how you're being punished in Azure. So if you exceed the two thresholds that I mentioned before, your IOPS and your your throughput, you are paid back in latency. That's what happens because if you're exceeding your thresholds, what happens is that you get moved to the back of the bus. Uh, you know you have to wait, and so it adds up over time. QDEPs. So that's how many uh, how many workers that you have, how many outstanding jobs you have waiting to be processed. So the you know the it comes in requests come into the CPU, it does the processing, it assigns workers to it. But over time, if there's only so many workers that can work at the one time, and so all of those are left to your QDEP. So when you look at your server and the performance, you want to take a look at the QDEP because that shows how how hard could your server be working if it was able to do it? So it's something to keep in mind. All right, so async and, I, and sync IO. So synchronous IO in a database term is when you're talking about things like your transaction logs and your backups because you have serial transactions. So it's like they have to complete one after another. Async IO, which unfortunately is 95% of the transactions in a database are the random ones that come in. So you know, in your classic database example, like say maybe like your airline ticket counter or something like that, where you maybe have you know, 200 different requests reserving different places on the seat and they all have to be held. And then they're, uh, you know, some of them are completed, some of them aren't, but either way they have to all be kept track of. And I understand I'm actually talking about transactions, but still the point is, is that uh, asynchronous IO is what's going to happen with a database because, or you're talking about like a point of sale system. You're going to have people come in from all the different departments of the business and they're all going to be doing transactions at the same time. So asynchronous. And the reason why this is important is because it makes it harder for the system to judge it. Just like you personally, like if you had, you know, 20 balls coming at you from different directions, you could only probably process like two or three coming in there. But if you knew that all the balls were going to be shot at you from the same direction, well, then you could easily plan for it and be ready for it. Yes. So we are going to talk about Azure a little bit more, but uh, what's funny about here is that all this so-called old school stuff actually really applies up in Azure. As I said earlier before, you're paying for a service and Microsoft is only going to give you what you pay for. So because of this, we're also going to be talking about storage. Because if you don't plan ahead, you're going to have this problem. So let's talk about the second throttle point. So here, once again, is a list from the Azure Marketplace. So these are premium SSDs, and I'm going to tell you, don't even consider any of the non-premium SSDs unless you know that you really need the cold storage. But for any sort of database concerns, you want to do premium SSDs and even ultra disks, which are now becoming more available throughout the Azure uh, Ecoverse. But the main, the something that you can access are going to be premium premium disks. And you can see here, so they're all classified by the different, uh, you know, you have your P4, P6, P10. One of the things you may notice here, which is the unfortunate uh, problem with the premium disks, which is why that Microsoft released Ultra Disk, but they're so damned expensive that everyone's still doing premium disks, is you see that if you want to get more storage, you pay for bigger sizes. But the other real problem is that in order to get more performance, is that you need to buy the bigger sizes. And so you can see right here, so it goes, it doubles, and then it's a little bit more than doubling here, so it's more like a, like 120%. And that is truly one of the problems, is that, so for instance, right here, if you wanna get a disk that has reasonable performance, you have to buy a terabyte in space, and maybe you don't really need that much space. But that's just kind of the way it is, and also the throughput too. And you have to remember, is that this is not an and equation. This is an either or. So, or I'm sorry, rather it is an and. So both of these two, the throughput and the IOPS 
uh, can add up. So if you can you can exceed, uh, you know, they both can contribute. So let's say, for instance, if you got up to 2,600 IOPS, and so you were fine on IOPS, but you exceeded the throughput on 200, you're going to be punished. You're going to have that latency. And this next slide uh, reinforces that. So let's talk about the, uh, the P30. We're going to be using that for example. So uh, these are the real calculations, uh, the actual latency, the average latency. That's, that's what Microsoft is promising that they're going to give you. So uh, a P30 is a great disk. It's a big disk. It's got lots of performance uh, capabilities right there. So if you were doing a synchronous I.O. transaction, so if you're writing logs to this disk, in one second, 1,000 milliseconds, the uh, you're going to be doing 500 IOPS because the way the math works is that you have uh, a transaction going there. It's you know the the time, which is 1,000 milliseconds or one second, that's divided by the latency. So that means that you're allowed to do 500 IOPS in that one second. So in the case where that you maybe had a lot of really active instances, you could reach the max IOPS. So let's say if you had 10 active databases that were all writing logs to the same disk at the same time, you could exceed your IOPS. So here are my crude pictures right here to show how that um, you have your outstanding IOs processing through at 500 IOPS. But then if you had 10 databases writing to the same disk, you can quickly get to that max limit. Again, Log writing, unlikely. In uh, asynchronous I.O., much more likely. And then the other thing to remember is that your biggest bottleneck is always going to be your network speed. Uh, I, and I'm just saying this from practical experience. I mean, it can be a real problem, is that even though you may have your databases in the cloud, you have your servers in the cloud, and even you have your applications in the cloud, well, guess what? Your users have to be somewhere which means that they have to connect via network. So please, 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 when you think about it, this is not just for migrations, but just also for general practice, is remember that your network is going to be their biggest bottleneck, and you need to make sure that the users have adequate connections as well. So especially even in like this remote world we have, is that I'm sure that a lot of businesses have been busy uh, helping their users to pay for bigger pipes from their home. But even if they weren't at home, even in the office, you want to make sure that you have adequate network connections. So let's talk about throughput for a little bit here, too. Uh, so we know here, again, with our P30 disk that we have, um, I'm going to check my, check my time here really quick. OK, we're good. Uh, anyway, so the so in the P30, OK, so if the average block size uh, is going to be 256K, and that's standard in SQL Server. So if you have a lot of asynchronous requests, so we're talking now about your basically everything other than log writing and backups in a database, so pretty much the whole world, uh, and you're doing lots of requests for data. So if you take your um, 500 IOPS and you multiply it times the size of it, all of a sudden you're actually doing 125 megabytes per second. So you have to think about that carefully, is that what may not seem like a whole lot of requests, so 500 IOPS is not a whole lot of requests, but then when you add the size of that of that packet, all of a sudden you are can get to that maximum throughput. It doesn't take very long. This is right here. This is, um, I'm trying to remember exactly where I got this chart from. I think I found it. This is just talking about, oh, I just, just trying to break it down. But uh, we were talking just to show you the math is how quickly you can get to the point is that so, you know, like if you have whoops, if you have a small, uh, you know, small, small size packets, but you have a lot of them. So this would be like, um, I don't know, some sort of anyway, some sort of transaction, but you can see where you get your throughput. So you have to do the math here. So let's go back and look at that once again. So you have your you have your IOPS. So each one of your IOPS is a certain amount of data that's coming through. So you have to multiply you have to multiply the two to see exactly what the throughput's going to be. So again, it gets back to that disk where you have that you have those thresholds. And we're going to see the disk chart again, but you have the thresholds. And so it's, you can see how easy it is to reach that. So right here, we're looking here. So these are relatively small packet sizes, and you do a lot of them, 
okay, your throughput's only 40 uh, megabytes per second, but let's say you were doing something crazy where you were doing much bigger packets, it wouldn't take very many of those big packets in order to reach your throughput bandwidth quickly. Uh, this is going to be more of what you're going to see for like a database sort of, uh, in fact, 64K is actually the recommended size when you're creating your disks in a SQL server that so you always want to set that up. When you're formatting your disk, you want to set it for 64K size. So do that. But once again, uh, get a certain number of transactions going, you reach the throughput. I mean, so you can see how it's easy to reach this limit and then you start to pay for it. I came up with this cat picture to show the, uh, the asynchronous, the, you know, what's more random than a cat. So now we start to think about throttling. So if we have our the P30, the same example we've been using before, and let's say you have 15 outstanding IOs. So what's going to happen here? All right, let's, let's go back over this. It gets, it gets a little bit confusing, and it, maybe I'm just confused. So if we are doing, um, if we're trying to exceed it, so let's say that you have, let's go, okay, so right here in this example right here, we're talking about, um, let's say if you have 15 outstanding IOs and each one of them is going to, is going to be 500 IOPS. And so at that point, you've reached 7,500 IOPS because you know that it's going to be, we're talking again about the example that the, the IOPS per second, so you get to that point, you have 7,500 IOPS, and so all of a sudden you're exceeding the max IOPS of the disk. And so then what happens is things start to get slower. So all of a sudden you're only able to do 333 IOPS per second. So you're going to see your transactions get slower. And the way this translates is that the latency. So let's say that you had 20 outstanding IOs and you get a latency of four milliseconds. If you had 50 outstanding IOs, you have 10 milliseconds of latency. So the more work you load onto that disk, the more the slower things are going to get, which only makes sense, but it's one of the changes you have to do in the way you think about using the resources. In before, you could just say that the server is slow and then probably your sysadmins could go change something or the DBAs or something like that, but now, it gets down to just simple money costs. You have to look at the servers and you have to analyze the disk. And it, again, it's not all wonderful once you get up in the cloud, you have to actually pay attention to how you set these servers up. And the other problem is that Azure checks the IOPS and the throughput limit every 50 milliseconds, not every second. So every time at 50 milliseconds, if you've exceeded either one of those thresholds, you get punished. And so all those outstanding IOs are postponed until the next 50 milliseconds when it checks again. So it gets worse and worse and worse. And so that's why you can have the whole business come to a, you know, kind of come to a crawl. And why are they doing that? Because of data integrity, because all of these are network requests. And so they want to make sure that everyone else is not being, is not, there's no chance of losing any data because Microsoft very, uh, are promising that five, nine sort of, uh, you know, as far as your the safety of your data as they should but that means that they are going to slow down the performance in order to make sure that all of your rights are happening that you're not losing anything because that would actually be more traumatizing to your business than for your users to be slowed down and yes we're going to actually talk about azure so anyway again went over all that just to give you a preparation and there's a lot more depth that we can go into there and i understand that's a bit of a confusing topic but it's really important to understand about the limitations of the vms that you're creating in azure and also about thinking about your storage layer too if you look at the charts for a while you'll understand it but it's usually better to spend a little bit more money and make sure that you have lots of room to grow on your servers so as we're talking about preparing for your azure lift and shift so manage your unmanaged disks. Uh, actually, I don't think you can even buy unmanaged disks anymore. So this is actually, I apologize, this is a little bit dated. So disk layout, you'll find that the same classic rules for SQL Server still apply. Your caching can be very important. 
tempdb, and then finally networking. So whether you're, um, this is the part that I think is a little bit dated. Uh, I think now that you don't have a choice, I don't think you can actually create unmanaged disks anymore. So I should have, um, but the point is, is that it, back when I wrote this slide, is that you would restore your virtual backup uh, from, uh, I mean, now we have the Azure migration tools and all that sort of thing, but back in the time when you would restore, you would create a some sort of a VM type backup of your server you would move it up into your Azure landing zone and you would restore it. And when you did that, what would happen is, is that the your disk would be created in the exact same size. And maybe that's the same, I need to check on that again. But what would happen is you would have Azure blob storage and they are limited to 60 megabytes throughput. So managed disk, uh, Anyway, if you have the option, you always wanna to go to managed disks and you wanna use actual SSDs, uh, they're still, SSDs on some sort of a disk storage layer, but the point is you're actually using real SSDs. So you can also group them if you want to, even though we're not gonna talk about that. I tend to go ahead and just put in a single large disk to get the performance rather than doing storage pools. Uh, main thing is that you can use the Azure portal and you can do all the monitoring. And then we have Ultra SSDs, which are now a reality in most areas, I believe. Uh, they're still being rolled out. They are horribly expensive. I mean, you just look at them and they cost you money, but it is the only way to really tune your storage layer in order to meet the requirements of your system. So right here, you can see here, this was a unmanaged disk. And as you can see right here, this is after a migration and you can see there is no IOPS limit and there is no throughput limit uh, because it just wasn't posted, but it is 60 megabytes per second. And then right here, this is actually a premium SSD. So this is a P30, this is a one terabyte. Um, the, anyway, as you can see right here, is that, uh, so we have no problem with the threshold or the, the throughput. So one of the things that we wanna talk about doing that here is that you wanna make sure that as you're setting up your new servers, the, uh, you want to, as you can see right here, so this goes back to that chart I showed you where the limits. So right here, this was actually a P20, I believe. So you have the IOPS limit of 2300 and you have the throughput limit of 150 megabytes per second. Uh, yeah, so yeah, there's a P20 right here with a 512 gigabyte size. So the idea is that as you're, so this is something you want to think about is that um, you want to make sure that you buy the disks that are the big enough, but you also have to be aware of these limitations so the same rules that have actually applied for SQL Server forever uh, haven't changed any. So ideally you wanna go ahead and have separate storage for data, you wanna have separate storage for logs, and you wanna have separate storage for tempdb. Uh, and then also there's caching available in the drives. So this is in the, when you're setting up the drives, you can uh, go in Azure portal. So as you attach your disk to your new server, uh, so you, uh, best practices are recommended that you do read-only caching for the data drive. You do no caching for the log drive. And then tempdb, uh, it's going to have read-write caching by default. We're going to talk about the using the uh, separate SSD on the server for tempdb. And then we get into caching. We're going to talk about caching a little bit. It gets a little bit complicated, too. But let's first, let's talk about tempdb because this is where you can really make the difference. I think tempdb is gonna make more difference than it will be for caching. Uh, so there's, I have uh, references at the end of this where I got the general idea and then I, every time I set up a new server. So when you most, I think every, uh, every server that you would consider for SQL Server in the cloud is going to have this ephemeral uh, tempdb or server uh, is a drive attached to the, it's actually attached to the chassis. So when you go to that chart, let's see if we have that chart. Um, let's go right here. Uh, where to go? I should have put one right there. So C right here, this is when we're looking at the actual server when you're at the compute size. So this is what I mentioned about here is that you have an SSD. And so it's advertised as temp storage, which is true because the tricky thing about it is that that drive is actually temporary storage. 
And the main thing is, is that when you look at it in the drive, in fact, there's even a little note and I have a picture uh, coming up here where it's, there's a little uh, notepad document that's in the drive and says, warning, this drive is temporary. Any information stored in here will be deleted every time the server is rebooted. So it's not actually rebooted. It's actually when the disk is actually, uh, if the server is deallocated. Uh, but the point is, is that everything's deleted, but TempDB doesn't care. So if you go through, there's a, a, a uh, I use a script, it's a combination of Power, it's PowerShell and using DBA tools, is what it does is it will actually make sure that every time that you, whether you deallocate the server or not, but every time you reboot is that TempDB is going to be creating that drive. The reason why that drive is important, again, is that it's an SSD, and it's actually attached to the chassis, which is where you're, you're assigned to in when you pay for that VM in Azure. So it's going to be to give you the very best performance you can for TempDB. So when you look right here, so this is uh, this is using premium SSDs, and you can see right here that these latency numbers are horrible. So this was paying for good storage, but uh, you know we look at this the crazy numbers right here. Here's the note that's in the temporary drive. And then here's the script, and I apologize, it's a little bit slow, a little bit small to see, but pretty much what the process you're doing is that you have to set up the, you use uh, in your server, you want to use scheduled tasks, and so you're actually setting up a task, you can set tasks to run on reboot of the server. And so what it does is it runs the PowerShell script, and so the PowerShell script goes through and it checks to make sure that there is a folder on that drive, because since it's if it's deallocated, then it's going to delete everything, including a folder structure. If not, it creates the folder. It goes in there and it starts up SQL Server long enough because you have to start up SQL Server in order to allocate tell SQL Server where TempDB is. So it does that, starts up SQL Server, it goes ahead and then it uses uh, DBA tools to use the uh, the applet or commandlet set dba temp db configure and so you the nice thing about that is you can just put the number in so you you already know what the size is and so then it automatically divvies up the available storage you've told it to use into uh, a number of equal temp db files and then it stops sql server and it restarts it again using that new temp db space uh, it takes a little bit of configuration to get it right but once you do then you can just forget about it so once I did that and I set that up, all of a sudden my latency issues went away. I mean, they, it still wasn't perfect. I mean, compared to these other numbers right here, you can see these are probably, these are gonna be for the data drives. Like I read, this was the data drive. Uh, we had some archive drives, but still going from, you know, 5,800 milliseconds to 760 milliseconds is a lot better. Some of the other things you have to keep keep in mind is networking. And I've seen uh, some of my customers when I'm doing getting ready for migrations, it, you have to take the time to go through the, the, with the customers and make sure that they're aware of this. So network security groups are the, the common tool used in Azure to set up the, the rules for the firewall. But you want to remember these basic ports. Uh, so 1433 is is open anyway. Uh, but named instances, they require 1434 in UDP. Analysis services, it has its own port requirements. Again, if you have named instances, uh, integration services, if you had to do, if you weren't using Azure Data Factory 135, and then SSRS, you want to make sure that port 80 is open. But those are the common ports that you're going to need for SQL Server stuff, but applications can have weird ports. So it's important to take the time to go with the work with the business, whoever the customers you're working with, and identify all the applications and then take the time to look and see if they what port they're using on the network because you may you're going to need to open up those ports in the firewall especially if the users are going to be connecting from somewhere outside the cloud which is most likely going to be the case so uh, you don't want to have that situation where you've done everything you've done your failover you're ready to go and then all of a sudden other users can, to, can connect So as she said, how do you do all this again? So plan out, you know, ideally have a baseline of what your existing servers are. So go ahead and buy uh, at the by appropriate compute level that allows for the, you know, the throughput. Thinking about your disk layout, uh, ideally you're going to have separate disks for logs and data. Uh, 
Uh, and, and you know, logs, you don't really need to have that much space. So when you're looking at the cost here, uh, you know, maybe you can save a little bit of money there. But the truth is, even storage isn't all that expensive in Azure. I mean, that's kind of where they get you. But I mean, it's it's still uh, I guarantee. And we're going to show I'm going to show you a couple uh, charts showing there why you want to do those things. So go ahead and set your caching. Like I said, that you go ahead and set read caching for your data drive and no caching for your log drive. Uh, this step, not going to worry about so much. Uh, so depending on how it works out, you may use this as an opportunity to rearrange your drive so you can you can actually put all your databases. Maybe you had some sort of a situation where you had uh, logs and temp DB and data all on the same drive when it was on prem. And so now here's your chance to reorganize your house, get rid of some of those old databases and set them up onto the appropriate drives. And then finally, set up your temp DB boot script. Now, I have this script available, so if someone wants it, just let me know, and I'll send you instructions on how to do it. And then finally, make sure that your network ports are open. It's a lot of stuff. Are there any questions, Frank? I mean, I'm not sure. Um, at the moment, there are no questions, Mark. OK. All right. Well, hopefully, there's a few people still out in the audience. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's good. <laughs> All right, so Thryland. Let's look at Thryland a little bit. Okay, so this is a malt, uh, the uh, insights preview. The I don't think it's a preview anymore, but anyway, so monitoring. So this is the main re reason you want to have managed drives. And again, I apologize slightly. Uh, it may be that this stuff is common now, but I don't think it is. I think you, you still have to set up insights. is not automatic. You have to set up the log analytics in Azure so you, in order to get this information. So right here, you can see here where we had this set up and we had the uh, the log drive and we had temp db uh, and you can see right here you have the latency right here you can it, i didn't quite get the whole column but the point is you can see the latency right there so why is it that i was having latency issues uh, oh, and then also right here, this is the other one which should be circled right here. If you see here, this is the IOPS right here. So you can look at this right here. And so the, the insights was actually showing me what the problem was right here. Because this is the log drive right here. So it was not big enough. And so it was set to have a max uh, IOPS of 500. Well, guess what? So that's what we paid for and that's what we got. So because of that, we were having latency issues. I mean, this is huge. I mean, the, this for log, for writing logs, there's no way that you would ever want to have anything like this at all. So that meant that the database was literally slowed down to a crawl because every time it tried to write something, it had to wait forever in order to get to the point to have the opportunity to do it. And this was the basic problem. Banging your head up against the ceiling. Uh, once again, looking at this IOPS limit, throughput limit, and it was because of the sizing. So this is more, um, even though it was actually a premium drive, it just wasn't big enough. And went through and actually looked at, I ran perfmon against the server as well. And so uh, this in this chart right here, so this is the IOPS, and then this is the QDEPS. Look what's happening. So when you're getting to this point where we've reached the limit, guess what all those little workers are waiting there so those are all jobs that sql server is trying to do because it can't do it because of performance so you can see where perfmon can be very useful when you're trying to analyze performance problems on your server i mean we all know this but it still works in the cloud i guess that's really what my point is so the basic plan there was and then i also had a theory that it was probably impacting tempdb which is not a bad uh, thought there because if the whole server is uh if the whole server is slowed down then tempdb is probably traumatized as well so anyway so went through and bought a faster log disk and redid the baseline guess what happened it went from 128 uh, uh latency to 3.82 and even right here, you can even see that the IOPS, so everything was running a lot faster. So it was an artificial number because before that number was maxed out at 500. Because, so think again, this goes about the whole latency. So where I said how that every 50 milliseconds, Azure is going 
to recalculate your threshold and you're going to be punished with higher latency. So because of the, it just couldn't do as much work. So it wasn't, even though the numbers may be a little bit contraindictive, because if you looked at, you saw, you said before, oh, it was doing 500 ops. That means it's doing more work. Well, actually what was happening is that it had so much work to do that it was trying to force in that 500 IOPS every time. But the truth is, is that even though it was actually doing more work at the actual time, you had so many workers queued up waiting to do their work that you it wasn't actually getting as much work done at all. Now, as it was, it didn't actually really increase, improve the uh, latency for TempDB. The only way to truly get this number down is to go to go to ultra SSD. I did spend a little bit of money at one point and I experimented with that and it definitely will get your latency on TempDB down. But if you can't afford to pay for ultra SSDs, uh, you're going to be pretty good using the local SSD that's attached with every VM. And so here you can see this looks much more normal. These are when the transactions are being written to disk. So we talked about this at the very beginning of the presentation about the VM throttling. So I've been talking about storage, which is what I call the second throttle point. But the first throttle point is the VM throttling. So this is a, as I see right here, so you can see here. So if you get to the point where you actually can get your storage layer. So let's say if you're actually spending the money and let's say that you had a 10,000 IOPS limit on your storage, because the truth is IOPS is usually where you hit it. Throughput is not as likely, but uh, so let's just say again, it's IOPS. So let's say you've paid for the storage layer that's gonna give you a 10,000 or even a 15,000 IOPS layer. But if you attach these disks to this D DS11 right here, guess what? It's gonna hit that limit first, the 8,000 IOPS first, so it's going to calculate both of these. It's not just about the disk, it's about the actual server chassis too. So that's why this, it's kind of, it's a little bit evil. <laughs> you have to, you have to think about these things and you have to spend the money. And unfortunately it's hard to plan these things out when you're not actually in an Azure environment ahead of time. Because as most of us know, using Perfon is really kind of a pain in the ass. And, but that's what you actually would want to do before you actually do the migration if you could. Most likely you're going to be like everyone else and that's perfectly fine is that you're going to get there and you're going to find out that things aren't working quite perfectly. And so then you're going to go through and look and say, oh, OK, so we are having some uh, throughput issues. We're having some IOPS issue. We're going to go spend a little bit of money and we're going to increase the size of the compute layer if we can. Or we're going to do the storage. So like I said, evil math. Um, so this is where it also gets a little bit confusing too. So, okay, so wrap, try to wrap your head around this one. Okay, so if you, you, it gets complicated no matter how you want to do it. So if you are doing, using, so it's keeping track of these six, these different things. So what I almost have to recommend is that if you're going to use the temp storage SSD, which I highly recommend because that's the only way to, in order to get that performance. But once you start using that drive, guess what? Then all of a sudden it starts to calculate against your max, your max IOPS. So if you're not, it you you really have two choices. If you don't use caching for your data drive, which is probably a fine enough decision if you want to do that, then you have to worry about this. You have a lower through you have a lower IOPS right here if you do uncached. If you do cached drives, you have a higher IOPS, but all of a sudden, then all of your tempdb transactions, if you're doing set up your drives the way that I recommend, count. So it's, it gets down to the kind of a Faustian sort of equation, and that's not good, but that's one of the things that you have to think about. Now, granted, most people probably aren't gonna have this problem unless you're being really super careful with your budget which of course every company should be careful with your budget. But again, I can't stress this enough is that you have to look at these charts. You have to understand what you're doing and go forward and think about this before you make these decisions. Exactly, I get tired of listening to myself too. 
So this is where I was using Perfmon in order to look at the different uh, the transactions right here. And so I kind of wanted to see what was going on here, where I uh, did the math here, looking at you know the reads and the writes, which is your IOPS, and then you have your, your transactions. And it looks like I labeled this chart wrong, so I need to go back and check that. But the point is, is that um, you, you need to learn how to use Perfmon. It's the only way you're gonna be able to get this thing understood. Uh, right here, The other thing I would recommend is that I would always use Max when you're setting the filter in uh, in the portal uh, because average just doesn't tell you anything. You want to know where are all your peaks right here. So as you can see right here, we had some read operations that are up to 7K, which was probably exceeding the threshold. So once again, so the point of showing that right here is that in case this was like on the actual uh, the D11, which is right here, you can see right here where you have an IOPS throughput of 8,000. So in this case right here, this was getting pretty close to that threshold. Well, it is, it actually exceeded because it's both of them together. So when you add this up, this is about 7,000, you know, 7,000 or 7K per second, and this is 2K, so that's nine. Well, guess what? Uh, 8,000. So right there, even if the drives were able to support that, the VM wasn't, and so you would be punished. All right, so we've talked a lot about VMs. Let's talk briefly about SQL Azure Database. Let me do a quick time check. Let's see. All right, we're good. We've got a few minutes left. So this is uh, SQL Azure Database. So database is a service. I know that they've added in serverless stuff, so I need to update my presentation. I apologize for this, but DTUs still matter. So DTUs were considered they were a they're, and they're still there, you can still use DTU. So they're a all-in-one sort of uh, performance or not, I mean, it's the transaction, so it represents the CPU, the RAM, the IO, and the network. And one of the reasons I found this out was because I got to work on an interesting project at my uh, last job where I was doing replication, where I was doing replication from servers uh, to a SQL Azure database, which then that SQL Azure database was used for a data source for reporting all over the enterprise. But when I started doing the replication, I ran into issues and I was like, I have never seen a, if any of you, I actually like replication. I know a lot of people hate replication, but replication is really actually a very cool tool once you get everything set up correctly. But as you see here, look at this duration. That's a day. That's a day. <laughs> I was like, well, what the hell's going on here? So Brent Ozar, bless his cotton socks. Uh, I actually use SP Blitz first, which I hadn't do had hadn't used before, and uh, I use it to look at uh, SQL Azure instance. And so if you look in the Azure console, this is looking at so right here. Look at this DTU percentage max. So this is where I started learning about how to do performance monitoring on SQL Azure databases, which I hadn't didn't have a lot of experience with. Uh, so right here, you can see here that the poor thing was maxed out. No wonder that replication wasn't working. And one of the things I want to point out, which still has not been fixed, is that this doesn't mean the performance got better. This is just the way that Microsoft has chosen to represent the performance in the Azure console. And I feel that this is confusing. So you just should be aware of this. This is, does not mean that it went from 100% utilization at, was at like about 12.45 p.m. And at 12.50 p.m., everything was perfect. No, that just is the way it's represented. So I went there and looked at the, so here's the the old, the classic uh, DTU uh, console. Uh, and you can still do this. I mean, that's still an option right here. So if we go here, and so I went ahead and I said, okay, let's set the DTUs from going from like 10, which is the default, all the way up to 400. And then all of a sudden, the uh, we weren't maxed out anymore. And all of a sudden, the replication was working just fine. As you can see here, I put 400 DTUs. So uh, one of those things, again, I highly recommend that if you are moving to Azure that you take the time to learn how to use the Azure uh, monitoring console. It takes, there's a little bit of learning curve there, but it's gonna give you lots of really valuable information as you're moving forward. Uh, 
So Azure SQL Managed Instance, uh, I haven't spent a lot of time. I mean, I know the price is cheaper now, but the whole point was is to give you more of that SQL Server environment as a platform, as a service. Uh, and the main thing, the reason they want to use SQL Managed Instance is to be able to do the cross joins and link server activities. Uh, Azure SQL Data Warehouse, which is now Azure Synapse, I've spent a lot of time in Azure Synapse. Uh, same sort of rules apply along with the DTUs, so you can set that, except it's D, it's you know, Data Warehouse units instead. So let's go over what we learned here. Um, the And I've got all my contact information in the presentation. I'm happy to talk about any of this stuff uh, as you'd like. So the same basics still apply. I mean, it gets down to that you still want to have a separate uh, drive for logs, you want to have one for data, you want to have temp DB. Planning your storage is incredibly important in Azure. I can't stress this one enough. Uh, I don't think it's as likely that you're going to reach the VM chassis limits, but you're going to reach the storage limits. I guarantee that one. So plan at your disks, set them up correctly, and then move forward. And the other thing is, is that you know, Azure is going to give you what you pay for, no more. That's how Microsoft is making money. It's all set up on getting those getting those you paying for. And if you want more performance, you're going to have to pay for it. That's all there is to it. I thought that this was kind of an appropriate um, pictorial analogy about, again, once again, is that so on-prem is more like a buffet where you can go there as many times as you want with your plate and fill it up. But uh, Azure VMs are much more like dim sum where you have to pay for each individual dish. We've got a couple different references here, and that's it, so thank you.